Good evening. No slides for me tonight, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Todd? How are we doing? What a beautiful week it has been. I like when it's warm during the day, like even hot during the day, and then it cools off at night. I don't like when it starts getting cold during the day too, but although it is getting darker outside, I could pass on that too, but it's been a beautiful week. You know, the period in between summer and fall is pretty gorgeous. All right, we'll go ahead. We're a couple minutes past the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started this evening. I'll ask uh, Brother Eric, if you would, to lead us in an opening prayer. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we are so grateful that you uh, allowed us to come here tonight so we can uh, have this place to study your word. Uh, like my Christians, Father, we're just we're in awe of you, uh, humbled in your presence. So we can come and just speak to you uh, in prayer. Uh, we thank you so much for our gifts and talents, for the uh, way that we can use those. We pray, God, that you help us to be bold in our speech and our activity. Thank you, brother. All right, next up in this series of topics that will get you canceled, I thought tonight we would, I'm just kidding. That's not what we're talking about tonight. I only got one laugh, Brother Keith. He's, he's on track. We're not going to talk about uh, canceled topics. Thank goodness tonight I wasn't nearly as nervous starting this class as I was on that Sunday morning standing up here. Um, and I know you're probably less nervous too. So <laughs> let's talk about the book of James. That is a wonderful subject to cover, isn't it? I think when David asked me to cover for him tonight, uh, he was trying to think of something more difficult because he, he didn't want me to take one of his softball pitches uh, away from him this quarter. But I'm lucky to have the book of James. And, it, and we like it because um, it, it's the way we think, I think, as 21st century Americans, right? We, we like things practical. We like things that we, we can take upon ourselves with our, our yoke of individuality, right, wrong, or indifferent, right? We, we like things we can take upon ourselves with that yoke of individuality and make it happen, right? We like to learn new things and we like to apply them to our lives, uh, whether that be in the workplace or here uh, in church or things that we learn at school. We like to teach our children new things and see them apply them. And that's one of the greatest joys of parenting, right? And I think because of the language that James has written in and, and that being one of his key themes throughout the book, I think we very much relate to it. Maybe it's easier for us to understand than some other books. At least that's, that's why uh, I feel excited about covering the book of James. And I feel excited whenever I read James. And, and I was challenging myself to answer why, where that excitement came from. And I think that's, that's why. And Paul's letters are a lot like that. Some... I mean, there is some dense material, right? We think of Romans, of course, some, some areas of Romans, but, but I think Paul writes very much like what we think. Um, you know, what's interesting is that James is also has a, a very much akin with wisdom literature, right, and, and his format. And we, we kind of like wisdom literature, right? Like Psalms, Proverbs, we like, we like reading that as well. Uh, in, in format, it begins as an epistle, but, but it's more closely aligned thereafter, perhaps, with, with wisdom literature. It has an ancient Greek, Greek form of satire known as diatribe, kind of uh, imagining dialogues or creating dialogues, right? Sometimes talking to someone uh, who isn't there, but as if he or she really was there, uh, using even question and answer uh, format. James uses a lot of metaphors when he talks about nature and everyday life. Uh, some allusions to famous people in the past when he's looking for examples. Faith and works, for instance, right? He'll talk about Abraham. He'll talk about Rahab, who's examples of famous people, biblical people, uh, famous uh, people from the Hebrews past. 
Sometimes he'll give harsh addresses to readers. We like that kind of direct directness and clarity. Right? I like that. A lot of us don't really have time in our lives to, to figure out what's going on, and we appreciate the clarity and directness. So tell me exactly what you want me to do so I can do that, right? Isn't that what we ask our wives? <laughs> you notice Angela is in the ladies' class tonight, so it's a safe environment, right, until she watches this on YouTube later. Um, yeah, tell me exactly what you want me to do. James does, and he'll tell you exactly what he wants you to do. That's not the challenging part. The challenging part is doing it, right, because then he's going to tell you to do it. So harsh addresses to the readers, that's part of the format. And then heightened contrast. The most pervasive technique in the book is Proverbs, and that's probably the, the biggest tie to wisdom literature. He uses about 50 imperatives, which are, are like essential or urgent things, right? Imperative, like things that must be done uh, in, a, in 108 verses. Uh, and he indicates a very practical perspective. Uh, the writer's interest in action rather than mere belief and see, seeks to move his readers to a state of action, a state of doing things. And I know that we're going to cover the themes of the first two chapters of James tonight. That was specifically the homework that David laid out. And right before we get there, let's just briefly review a couple other notes about the book. Uh, the author, as we know, is James the Just, uh, widely recognized as the author of the brother, the brother of Jesus being the author. Right? There are some other uh, theories out there. Uh, we know that James was a leader in the Church of Jerusalem. Uh, is well confirmed uh, in most of the historical literature. The date of this book is likely to be written in the early to mid-40s. We know that James died in AD 62, and there is no mention of the book of the Jerusalem Council in 48 AD. So, so it's widely uh, supposed that the, book, the writing of the book was before that period. Some of the themes, we'll, we'll get to those in a minute. The audience is Jewish Christians. We're told right in the beginning, in the, in the greeting, the, the, he's writing to the 12 tribes and the dispersion. Those are essentially Jewish Christian house churches, right, outside of Palestine, outside of the, the historical uh, land of Canaan. Uh, we use the word assembly there, uh, uh, ecclesia, the same, the same thing we use today. Right, for the assembled churches uh, that form the individual congregations of the Lord's body. He talks a lot about double-mindedness, wavering between God and the world. That, in a sense, that's the Jewish identity at the time. Right? So, so that's one of his key themes, directly uh, pointed into his audience. Any questions or comments so far? No, it's a very interesting thing, I think, about that. We talked about in the very beginning, the fact that he did not acknowledge that he was the half brother of Jesus. Uh, that, and he was not, a, he and, and uh, his brother, who was a, one of the main leaders of the church of Jerusalem, uh, was not followers until we know that up to at, at John 7, 5 talks about that at that point Jesus is saying I have not my time has not come yet seems to be the start of when he really becomes interested in this on that but uh, so he was, had not been a follower of his half brother up until that point to have become such a strong uh, leader in, in the church and spokesman for Jesus as he did and I think that's a, a very interesting too he made no mention of, of his relationship not playing upon I'm, I'm a brother of this guy. You know, he showed his humility, humility of it beforehand. I think that starts, that's what starts his book of James out to be such a great book. That's a great point, Joe. I mean, what an what a automatic credibility you would have if you were a relative of Jesus you know, as close as a half-brother, right? That would be the perfect thing to introduce yourself as. Uh, if you're looking for credibility from Jewish Christians as well, right? why not tie that in? That's a great point. Thank you. I found something interesting, but, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this before we dive into the text, but I was looking at the martyrdom of James that I hadn't, I'd heard stories about before, but I hadn't really dug particularly into the historical literature uh, before I was studying for this class. There's an account of his martyrdom there, uh, and please anyone, anyone fill in uh, any comments here as we go through this. 
uh, according to Hegesippus, who, who is a second century Christian. And there's very little known about Hegesippus. Uh, his nickname was Hegesippus the Nazarene. He was a Christian writer of the early church. Uh, in spite of his Greek name, he may have been a Jewish convert. Uh, his works are generally entirely lost, except for eight passages that are quoted uh, by one of the early church fathers, Eusebius. In the church history of Eusebius, who was a bishop in Caesarea in the 4th century, uh, he gives a chronological account of the development of early Christianity from the 1st century to that time in the 1st century. And he mentions some of the work at Hegesippus here, who talked about the martyrdom of James, the brother of the Lord. And I wanted to read a little bit from that, from uh, Eusebius, Eusebius's Ecclesiastical History, from uh, AD 323. Uh, the manner of James' death is already indicated by the above words of Clement, who records that he was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and was beaten with a club. But Hegesippus, who lived immediately after the apostles, gives the most accurate account in the fifth book of his memoirs. And he wrote, James, the brother of the Lord, succeeded to the government of the church in conjunction with the apostles. He has been called the just by all from the time of our Savior to the present day, for there were many that bore the names of James. Because of his exceeding great justice, he was called the just which signifies in Greek, the bulwark of the people. Therefore, when many of the rulers believed, I'm skipping a little bit down, there was a commotion among the Jews and scribes and Pharisees who said there was a danger that the whole people would be looking for Jesus as the Christ. Coming therefore in a body to James, they said, essentially asking for his help, right? We entreat thee, restrain the people, for they are gone astray in regard to Jesus as if he were the Christ. I don't think they're going to like the message that James is going to tell the people uh, on their behalf. So, so the scribes and Pharisees entreated James to persuade all that have come to the feast of the Passover concerning Jesus. For we all have confidence in thee. For we bear thee witness as to all the people that thou art just and does not respect persons. Interesting because James in the chapters we're going to cover tonight talks very much about partiality among, among people. Do thou therefore persuade the multitude not to be led astray concerning Jesus. For the whole people and all of us also have confidence in you. Stand therefore upon the pinnacle of the temple, and from that high position you may clearly be seen that thy words might be readily heard by all the people. For all the tribes with the Gentiles also are come together for the Passover. So they place James up on the pinnacle of the temple, ask him to, to plead with the people on their behalf. And James answered in a loud voice, Why do you ask me concerning Jesus, the Son of Man? He sits at himself at the right hand, in heaven at the great power and it's about to come upon the clouds of heaven and then the people the people agreed with his testimony and saying hosanna to the son of david it reminds you of when jesus was entering jerusalem those same words the scribes and pharisees said again to one another we have done badly in supplying such testimony to jesus and they cried out and said this man is an heir and they threw him from the pinnacle of the temple and we're told then that, that he went up and they threw down the just man and said to each other, let us stone James the just. And they began to stone him for he was not killed by the fall. But he turned and knelt down and said, I entreat thee, Lord God, our father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Same words that his brother, uh, his half brother used on the cross, right? And one of them who was, who was a fuller took the club with which he beat out clothes and struck the just man on the head. And thus he suffered martyrdom. And they buried him on the spot by the temple, and the monument still remains by the temple. He became a true witness, both to Jews and Greeks, that Jesus is the Christ. And then there, there's some more in there about the siege of Jerusalem and how that was caused. Um, finally, the, like the straw that broke the camel, camel's back was the death of James. And I'm not trying to get into that because I don't really know. <laughs> I don't know too much about that. But it's pretty interesting as we read along. Is that something with which you all have been familiar, that story before, or that same historical literature? Any comments or questions on that? Very elaborate. Actually said that he was pushed off, not thrown, he was pushed off, and, the, and the, even though he hit the concrete of the, whatever the floor was, on there, and, then, and then they beat him to death. Yes. Because uh, they couldn't kill him by pushing him off a, a very high point from the temple. So he wasn't just a, a, a five foot push off or ten. It's supposedly a, a, a high, what a higher points on the temple. Yeah, very high. Like the pinnacle. And I don't know how high that would have been, but it would have been something to survive that and then get on your knees and ask for the forgiveness of the people who were stoning you after they pushed you off. Yes, that's really something. So we know that happened about AD 62. Any other comments or questions? All right, that's all I have for the, the context 
of the book. And now we'll dive uh, into the text here. Let's talk about some of the key themes from the book of James. What key themes did we, do we pick up in the first two chapters? Yes, this is a big one, right? Faith without works is dead. For sure. Yes, the testing of your faith. That we should be joyful when our faith is tested, right? Because that leads us to steadfastness, which leads us to, to completion or perfection. Yes, praying for wisdom. We're not alone in our testing, right? Uh, we can pray for God's wisdom, which we should all do. James is telling us to do it, right? That seems like that would be one of the first things we would do as we're getting into action mode. What other key themes do we see in the first two chapters? Yes, sir. God is not to be blamed for our temptations. Oh, good one. Who is to be blamed? Ourselves. Yes. Yeah, God is not to be blamed for our temptations. We, what, what leads us astray? It's our own lusts, right? Our own desires. You know, the pride, what does John tell us? The, the pride of life. What other themes? One of the things that's so point blank for us here at Gold Hill in there is the starting in chapter uh, verse 9 he talks about the perspective of the rich and the poor and how the rich is going to die and wilter away while the poor can in inherit or become rich in terms of, of the spiritual aspect of it. Yes. I mean, we need to think about that because we're a rich church. We're a very wealthy church. Yes. Look at every, about everybody in this room on there. We, we're, and you compare us to any other place in the, in the, the, the world. We're very, very rich. We, yeah, we're, we're wealthy among our peers, which are already relatively wealthy compared to the rest of the world. Very right. It's a wonderful story to make you become humble if you really, really want to live for Christ. Billy James spends significantly more time talking about the rich and how they are to be humbled than he does about the lowly being exalted, right? He, spend, he just tells us that the lowly or the poor are going to be exalted. And then he spends a few sentences to tell us about the risks, the things that will happen to the rich, the, the folks who have been exalted in this world. Thank you, brother. I think one of the things about James, he writes in a way when you're chapter two, Read off and read patience. And in the first chapter, he really wants us to understand that patience and wisdom go hand in hand. And if you want more patience, there's a side from access for it, but it has to be practiced. And you must be patient with that practice. So you can have the wisdom that you're, you're yearning for, you should yearn That's a great point. But if people, people always said, when I was a kid, I remember adults always saying, never pray for patience. <laughs> Why? Because it's going to come with testing, right? The, the only way to, to uh, increase our patience is to be tested and challenged. There's still more. It's a very rich book. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the showing or display of partiality. Right? And I find that very challenging. A lot of these themes very challenging. But, but for me, how do, how do I not feel more partial towards some people than others? Right? Some, some people I have friendships with because I've spent more time with. Or we have more things in common. That they might have little kids too, right? So we're just by happenstance in the same stage of life. So, so I automatically feel more partiality towards some people than, than others. Uh, so, so it's important for us to challenge our inner motives there. But also I think James in his spirit of action and doing, I think he's actually talking about the display or the show of partiality in the congregation. Uh, back at, uh, I may be partial to, to Mark on that, uh, to, to Dave saying, is that this is free, nothing about that. But if it comes to spiritual things, you better not let, let the rich over the poor, and I just use that as an example of that, uh, uh, come about, it cannot be. That, that's immaterial. He uses the, the rich person and the dirty person on there. But the dirty person 
you know, it's, it's, it's a lower. So, and usually if you can teach, if you can teach somebody on there, if they, they're a little better dressed than this next one, you better put that on the top, that on the bottom up here and, and think yes. about where you're going there. I think, so I think this is more spiritual than, than physical. Now, I know it has the physical traits also of not being, not being mean to others and good to others and that's on an equal basis there. I know that. But here, I really think it's more spiritual that he said, you better watch on that because uh, of who walks through the door. Are we willing to teach whoever it is, regardless who they are, what their background was? It's immaterial to, to God at that point if you teach him the word of God. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. I can see that deeper lesson there. James used the example right of, of where you're sitting, right, like on the floor in the seat. So there is that physical aspect, but I do see the deeper lesson and the spiritual meaning there for sure. Which makes us think about some sins that we might think are worse than other sins. And um, James kind of deals with that too, right? When he, when he deals with adultery versus other sins. And um, what, if, what if some of those sins that we have a more natural inclination to, that make us more angrier, I shall say. Some of those sins we were talking about earlier in the year during, that, uh, during our Sunday morning class. Um, like homosexuality or transgenderism. or If someone was to come into the body... Uh, how how would we treat them versus versus someone who wasn't that way, right? Who who came here uh, as a visitor? Maybe we should ask ourselves those sort of spiritual questions. It's a great point. Yes. And show, he tells us you show partiality, you're not showing love. Right. Love overcomes any uh, partiality. Good. This is a great discussion here. A couple, a couple others. Um, as I was doing the research here, and, and we might go over some of what we've already discussed. Uh, God is seen as a gracious giver, and the unchanging Creator, merciful and compassionate, a judge, the one and only God, a jealous God, a gracious God, and a healing God. We talked about this one. Wisdom comes from above. Right, uh, the benefit to us is that it helps us withstand trials. And the benefit to also to us, but to a, a group of us, is that it brings peace rather than discord. We know God allows tests and trials, but temptation doesn't come from God. That comes from us, our own desires. What James asks us to do is patiently endure temptation. Then he reminds us of the reward that comes uh, following our patient endurance. The primary trial uh, for this group, it, it might be poverty. And there's, I think, um, I think there was a lot more of a requirement for people during biblical times and the audience to which this is, the Jewish Christians to which this is written, to show mercy to the poor, right? Like they would have understood that maybe in a lot more practical manner than, than we do today. So that was definitely a trial for them. And the poor, we know, here are a special focus of God's care must be cared for by his people and not shown prejudice or ignored. That's a great point. You're controlling the temptations that, that lead us uh, to sin. Yeah, the power of the tongue, definitely a theme there, especially in chapters 3 and 4. The, the mandate to go beyond hearing the word to living it out in our daily conduct. He talks about prayer being a proper response to trials, but not necessarily a self-seeking prayer, Right? A prayer to God because he has the power to heal, physically and spiritually. And then the major theme, uh, faith and its relationship to both works and justification. Not a contradiction to, to other teachings in the Bible, right? But something that goes hand in hand with uh, Paul's teachings. All right, shall we go ahead and dive in here? I'll read through some of the text here, and we'll start in James 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nation. Greetings. Nice and direct. 
<laughs> this is who I'm writing to. This is my name. He humbly did leave off the half-brother of Jesus. So there's your greeting. You get one verse. I feel like sometimes Paul can use a few verses during his opening salutations, right? Next, James goes into the testing of faith in really the first 18 verses here of chapter 1. First, he talks about joy in trials. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So faith leads to what? Steadfastness? Yes. Which it leads to perfection, completion. In essence, if, we're, if, we're, if that leads us to completion, we're in a state of being incomplete before we get there, right? So right now, without backing all the way up, without the faith, without going through the trials that produce steadfastness, we are in a state of being incomplete. So we can't just skate by without going through trials and temptations, right? We, we can't seek out the easiest path for because being Christian is not an easy path, right? We're told it's the narrow road, right? And there are a few who seek it, a few who go that way. Uh, so there's no easy road for us. So if we're going to be Christians and we're going to do what James tells us to do, then we're going to come across trials. But we can be joyful about it. We don't have to be upset about that. We can be joyful because our faith through those trials, our patience, our patient endurance through those trials produces steadfastness that helps make us perfect uh, in the spiritual sense, uh, perfect through Christ Jesus our Lord, which gives us exactly what we lack. So, so really going through trials is the missing piece. In verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives us generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So God will help us, right? but we have to ask. And then when we ask, we have to ask in faith. So when I pray, I don't, I don't always expect God to do everything I ask. Right? This is, God's God, and I'm his creation, low and meek, and trying to make my way through trials and temptations. So how do I pray? Uh, I mean, this is a sincere question, really, uh, I think, for me and for all of us. How do we pray and not be double-minded about it? How do we pray in faith? How do we, is it a, pray, a prayer knowing that God can do what we ask? Or is it a prayer expecting God to do what we ask? According to his will, maybe. He'll say no or he'll say yes. Mm -hmm. So he answers every prayer. So we can expect that from him. But that, that doesn't say that we don't always expect a yes out of him. But he, he does one of three things of anything that we have. Because he may wait a, a while. I mean, you think about people. I taught one guy back on there who wouldn't even let his wife drive a car on the church grounds. Twenty years later, I, I walked out at the help I hired his son to work for for me my, on there, and I walked. He, he, my dad came to pick him up, and I told him that uh, I went out to him because they told me I, he wouldn't talk to you about church. I went out and talked to him about church as much as he talked. But twenty years later, I went back to that church. He was leading singing. Mm -hmm. You never know how long it'll take. I don't know that my words did, but it sure planted a seed at that time. So, I mean, that, that's, that's when I say that he may not even do nothing on there. It may be down the road like that. But, but so there, you've got to remember, he always is going to respond to our prayer one way or the other. To pray in faith would be knowing you're going to get an answer. Yes, sir. Um, I look at it as kind of a, you know, you, you have children. Um, do you do everything they ask of you, Josh? No. They still expect me to. Yeah. <laughs> They don't always know what they really. Yeah, need, right? yeah, that's a great, yeah, that's a great comparison. And it's the same, it's the same thing with us. We can ask, but God has a whole much, a whole different perspective than what we do. And so, what He provides, He knows is for in our best interest, as opposed to just providing everything we ask. 
I think it's very interesting in the New King James there it says no doubting in that verse there. And that's the key. We go to it. We, there's no, we cannot have a doubt. Will he answer or not? And that, that's critical. Because if, if faith is not very strong, if you go through and doubt it, that you'll get an answer. Very good. Anything else? Just in knowing that he knows the best for him. I find it hard to have joy <coughs> going through the temptation, even though I, in, in my mind, because I was always told that if God is still testing you, he's not telling you. And I'm like, yes, I, that sounds great. That's a good man on the middle of the But at that time, I'm not feeling that. It, it, but I, I see as I got to this age, no, nah, it's okay. I can see a plan. I can see a plan. So when, when even my prayers have kind of changed because my journey with them has changed. Mm -hmm. My journey has changed. My prayers are a little bit different than what they started out <coughs> when I first got here. So I think patience goes with your journey. You know, with your faith goes with your your practice wisdom that you get through, the, through this walk. The more you walk with God, the more wisdom you ought to get. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Dave. Uh, Gary, I think part of that's maturity. But, um, you know, if you look at this first chapter, it's all about being steadfast. It's about perseverance. It's about being consistent. And Man in itself, we pride ourselves in wisdom. We, we know what's best for us. And when we actually go and pray to God, it's like, well, we, we don't know. We don't have the answer. So as a last resort, we're going to ask God. That's right. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what this is saying is, you know, we're going to be tossed back and forth, you know, like the waves. We need to come out of the chute confiding in God asking God, not, not waiting for we have a mess and uh, or, or completely confused. So. That's right. I think what we're talking about is the, the journey to steadfastness. Right? Work, working through the things that we're talking about now is, is the road to steadfastness. And maybe that road never ends. Like Harry says, right? I mean, maybe we thought we were steadfast before, but probably 20 years from now we'll be really steadfast. <laughs> <laughs> the trials get bigger, right? Yeah. Steadfast. I mean, you know, what was the early church enduring during this time? And we, we talk about, um, you know, whatever trials and tribulations we're going through at this particular time. These people were being dragged from their homes and, and murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you don't think they were praying? You don't think they were asking God for deliverance? Um, but the reward wasn't here. And God knew that. And, you know, we, you know, there was a song back in my day, I never promised you a rose garden. And I, and I think we've got it pretty easy beyond that. Yeah. What year did that song come out? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, yeah, I agree. We can't disagree. We're like, like Joe said before, which connects us directly to the theme of it, for those of us who've already been exalted in this life, this is even more applicable. Right? The poor, the poor and the lowly and the downtrodden, they're probably already a lot more steadfast if they've been enduring, if they've been praying, if they've been trying to, to, to navigate their way through their trials. Robert, did you have something before? Yeah, actually it was kind of along the same lines as Mark. And, you know, I hear the conversation about asking, and if you, but if you look at James, um, verse 5 talks about asking for wisdom mm. and so that becomes the starting point and, and then you know that wisdom would lead us to understand that whatever we may be asking for in terms of relief from trials or whatever is fine I suppose but to focus on that minimizes what we know to be the end of the story which, which is our salvation, right? That's the point, not just of James, I think, in this starting point here with wisdom. It's, it's the point of, say, 1 Peter chapter 1, you know, where, where Peter was writing that just before the Roman Empire started.
started their systemic persecution of, of Christians. You know, it, and, and Peter minimizes that saying, I think the word exactly is, though now you have to face trials, you know. It, 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 he just mentions it and then moves on and then focuses on the salvation that is already secure. And, and all of this, in my mind, ties together because it, it starts where James starts, and that is understanding the wisdom of knowing that that salvation is secure. You may still face the trials, but that knowledge puts those trials in perspective. And, and therein lies the wisdom that great. God promises. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. These are great comments. Thank you all. Very much appreciated. Yes, sir. Go back to Joseph. Look at all the trials that God put him through. And yet, again, it was God's will that all those things happened. He had to bring him where he was to save his father. Yeah. That's a great point. Right? It kind of reminds me of Matt's class a couple weeks ago, right? We were talking about the providence of God in, in each of our lives. And it, it, with hindsight, we can see some of those dots connected led us to where we are today. Thank you for all those wonderful comments. Uh, picking up here in verse 9, we'll keep pushing forward. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. And then he focuses on the rich here from verse 10 for, for a couple verses. Uh, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a flower, a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even when they go about their business. So the theme there, right, is the place of the rich and the poor before God, who is the great equalizer. Right, the, the lowly are exalted and then the rich are humbled. And then verse 12, just like, just like Brother Robert was talking about, the reward for those who endure. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood that test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. We read some more uh, about unity a couple weeks ago uh, during a Devo, and we talked about how one thing we can be united, and along, along with being Christians and the identity of Christ, uh, is the reward that Christ is going to bring with him. Uh, and that's what James addresses here in verse 12. Could we read a couple other verses that talks about the reward we have uh, in front of us? And I'll just ask for a couple volunteers if I could. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. I have another verse here. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. And one more if you don't mind. Revelation 22, 12. So Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Are we, are we greedy or selfish because we expect or look forward to receiving that inheritance? I don't think so. I think, I think we're, told, we're told to expect it. Right? Yes. If does not truly believe, God can keep his promises. Yes, maybe we're double-minded, right, if we don't, are unstable or not steadfast. Is and that he is a reward for those who don't change. Yes. Him. Great. Okay, uh, next up, 1 Corinthians 9 7, please. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Thank you, brother. We're, we're, we're supposed to expect it, right? We're putting in the work. <laughs> we, we made out of our own free will, which God gave us, the decision to be baptized into his body and to do what James is telling us to do. So we expect that reward. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one, of, each one for what he has done. I want to have you read all the Revelation verses, brother. <laughs> that's a good, that's a great verse. Thank you. 
Verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. And there's a little bit of a process he's going to walk us through here. Eric brought this up last week when we were talking about the themes of James. But, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So, so there are stages there, right? From, from our own desires and lusts all the way to death. And that, that's the road that sin leaves us down. So James tells us not to be deceived. My dear brothers and sisters, every good and perfect gift, gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does, not like, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of the first fruits of all he created. And then we'll talk more about listening and doing. Was it, did a bell ring? Oh, goodness. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. For the rest of the chapter one here, James compares hearers of the word and doers of the word. He talks about the implanted word, how it saves, right? It's the antidote, if you will, to our unsaved condition uh, prior to that, to the filthiness and wickedness, the anger that exists. And then, and then he talks about doing being a blessing, our ability to, to do these things. Uh, to follow Christ's teaching and behave as he behaved is really a blessing. Shifting now to chapter 2, if you would. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor, poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat to you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor of my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So in that sense, I think partiality is defined as making distinctions among ourselves. We'll skip down to verse 8 here for time's sake. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, that's a great title for this. Like the royal law of love. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Forever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it. So showing partiality means we are not showing love. There in verse 12, he tells us to speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. A reminder of what's to come. Right, and the famous, famous one of the seven habits, right, begin with the end in mind. And I think about wisdom literature again then in the book of Ecclesiastes. That was very much Solomon's point in that entire book, right, that, that we should live with our death and our judgment in mind. And then faith and deeds takes us through the rest of the chapter here, verses 14 through 26. I would say that Paul and James very much agree that salvation comes by grace through faith. James is just saying that works is not the basis of salvation, right? But the necessary result of salvation. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, in verse 14, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. And then he talks some about the examples of Abraham and Rahab. Essentially, the faith not accompanied by action is useless and dead. Anything on that topic? Any, any comments there or observations? Um, Yes, sir. Just like, just like Peter draws the comparison of Noah and the people who had the faith to actually get on the, the ark. Right? That's 
a great point. Anything else as we wrap up James chapters 1 and 2? Verse 26. Indeed. It's a good way to close this out for tonight. Thank you very much for your insightful comments. That class went by very quickly. I hope you.